Institute of Systems Biology in Town Hall as part of our Seattle Science Lectures and Town Green series, sponsored by Microsoft, the Wincoat Foundation, Northwest, the Peach Foundation, and KPLU. I realize I neglected to find out approximately how long tonight's panel will run. What do you think, Luke? What's the run time, do you think, tonight? 8.35. 8.35 and out. It'll be crisp. Uh, we will have time for your questions as the evening progresses. We'd ask that you come to the microphone to the edge of the stage there and uh, there, so we'll hear your voice in the recording being made this evening. That, uh, tonight's program, like uh, most things that happen at Town Hall now, uh, end up eventually on our media library uh, on the homepage. You drift over the right-hand side, there's a little button that says play. There's audio and sometimes video of things that have happened here. It's especially useful if you want to roll back and catch something you didn't quite grab the first time, or you want to share tonight's program with someone who wasn't able to join you, so I'd encourage you to check that out. After the Q&A, our Town Hall Cafe space, the impromptu one set up on the south side of the lot of the building room here, uh, will be open for another 30 to 45 minutes and give you a chance to hang out and talk about what you've heard with the friends that you brought or the friends that you made here. I want to acknowledge, actually, off the script for a second, that this is just the latest of what has been a rich, ongoing, unofficial collaboration with the amazing folks at ISB for probably all of my nine years here. Um, it's in some ways emblematic, I think, of how Town Hall operates best in its relationship to this community. We act as kind of a production department for the big thinkers who are off doing more important things than producing events about their work. And then when they have ideas that they want to introduce into the conversation in the city, they turn to us and we help make it into a public program. So I'm incredibly grateful to ISB and the many folks who've collaborated with us over the years to bring rich programs into this calendar and introduce uh, these ideas uh, for the consideration of the city at large. So thank you, friends at ISB. Before I introduce our guests, I want to mention some other upcoming events in our science series uh, at Town Hall. On Monday the 30th of March, John Hargrove, one of the stars of the documentary Blackfish, will be here to talk about whales, captivity, and sea world, and the fate of sea world. Uh, on Thursday the 2nd of April, PBS host Scott Sampson will join us for a program about connecting kids to nature in an increasingly technologically mediated world. Add to those events a discussion of free trade with former Congressman David Bonnier, an unconventional mixer between local visual artists and local visual arts fans, uh, hosted by Town Hall artist and residence Juan Alonzo, Juan Alonzo Rodriguez this Friday, and also an intimate evening at the Sorrento with author T.C. Boyle. I'm realizing as I'm saying that the word different, intimate has a different kind of connotation in that context, doesn't it? At any rate, um, T.C. Boyle will be reading up at the Sorrento on Friday. Uh, as well as uh, just announced or soon to be announced events with Richard Haig, Robert Putnam, Jimmy Gilder, Nathan Mirvold and Richard Thaler, Jeremy Smith and Christopher Murray, a World Science Festival viewing party, and another edition of our Oot Nanny All Ages Sing Along in tribute to Pete Seeger, and that's an impossibly reduced taste of the next seven or so weeks here at Town Hall. The best way to stay in touch with our program is to become a member in this place. Memberships start at $40 and go north from there and for it. You get seats down front at our programs, discounts on book purchases and ticket purchases. We'll send you a calendar in the mail every month, old-fashioned paper calendar. Perhaps most important, you join a cohort of almost 4,000 folks from around the region who every year make this program possible for everyone. Uh, Town Hall last year offered 422 events to 106,000 people through the support and belief of its membership. So if you are a member and you're here with us tonight, I want to express my gratitude to you for making this place possible. And if you're not, I hope you'll consider joining us. Now after all of that, on to tonight's remarkable panel. Dr. Leroy Hood is the co-founder and president of the Institute for Systems Biology, a Seattle nonprofit that focuses its studies on the interrelationships between biological systems and adv advocates for an interdisciplinary approach to research. His research has led to great strides forward in the fields of immunology, neurobiology, and biotechnology, and he has received 17 honorary degrees, more than 100 awards, and is one of only 15 individuals with memberships to three national academies, Science, Engineering, and the Institute of Medicine. In recent years, he has focused much of his personal work on P4 medicine, a conception of healthcare that is predictive, preventive, personalized, and participatory. Dr. Stuart Kaufman is an affiliate faculty member at the Institute for Systems Biology, a MacArthur Fellow, and the author of three books, including At Home in the Universe, The Search for the Laws of Self-Organization and Complexity. Dr. Lauren Buckley is an assistant professor at the University of Washington's Department of Biology and a two-time National Academy of Sciences Kavli Frontiers of Science Fellow. And Dr. Dennis Hartman is a professor at the University of Washington's Department of Atmospheric Sciences 
and the author of the textbook, Global Physical Climatology. They're joined tonight by Luke Timmerman, an award-winning biotechnology journalist who has written for the Seattle Times, Bloomberg News, and Ex Exconomy. He'll moderate our discussion of the tipping points in our climate, sudden large-scale uh, environmental changes, many that seem to defy our sense of causation, but which can be studied and explained through the interdisciplinary approach of systems-level thinking. Please offer a warm town hall welcome to this terrific panel. Selling book, it's mostly about social phenomena, things like uh, why certain products become popular fads, or um, how little things in, say, law enforcement, like a, a policy that uh, tries to stop people from breaking windows in neighborhoods, can somehow lead to a reduced crime rate, or so we think. Uh, but part of the, the issue with these complex phenomena, like crime rates or whether a product takes off is um, you have a question. Who is who? We're getting we're getting to that. <laughs> uh, the, the complex phenomenon is uh, you know figuring out which factors uh, really cause the outcome you want. Uh, and figuring out what that is is part of the big big challenge today in biology and in climate science. So we have some great people here who could talk about that tonight and uh, they're going to speak for a few minutes, uh, introduce themselves briefly, and talk a little bit about their research, and then we will uh, go into moderating questions and answers, and I encourage folks from the audience to raise your hand and get my attention like this lady in, in the front, front row. So uh, first off, we can start with uh, Stu Kaufman. Stu, would you like to tell us what, you're, what are you doing in the, in the world of biology <laughs> that relates to tipping um, points? Um, so I trained as a philosopher in MD, and uh, Hold microphone over to you. Oh, I trained as a philosopher and an MD, um, and then went into experimental and, and theoretical biology, and I've worked on things like what, what has become systems biology starting a long time ago, the origin of life, which will be part of what I'll actually talk about today, some economics and some physics, <coughs> and uh, forgot how to play the guitar. Um, so I want to talk about something that's related to what, what you said. Um, there will be talks, and, and we'll hear from Dennis, about chaotic dynamical systems, perhaps, and stuff like that. Um, I don't want to talk about that. I, um, yeah, I want to talk about the notion of functional holes. And it's a very old idea. It goes back to the famous philosopher Immanuel Kant, who said in the Critique of Judgment, um, an organized being, then, has the property that the parts exist for and by means of the whole, for and by means of the whole. The parts need the whole to get to exist, and the whole needs the parts to get to exist. So I'm going to call that a Kantian whole. Now I've thought about the origin of life for many, many years. I'm going to give you just one example. There's a bunch of theories about the origin of life. One is the idea that you could have a set of molecules that undergo reactions, and the molecules themselves catalyze the reactions or speed them up does, so that the reactions go faster, and a set of molecules mutually catalyze one another's formation. Well, it's not imaginary. Gonan Ashkenazi in, in, in the Ben Gurion um, has done it with nine small proteins called peptides. Each protein catalyzes the formation of a second copy of the next protein out of two fragments of the second copy. That um, that are glued together to make a copy of the second molecule around a circle of the nine peptides. I, I, I hope you have the image. 
it's what I will call a collectively autocatalytic set. No molecule catalyzes its own formation. The set as a whole does. Um, so it's a Kantian whole. Um, the parts are the peptides, and the whole is the nine sets of peptides. If you think of catalyzing a reaction as a task or a functional task, the system achieves, in the simplest sense, the task closure. All the tasks that have to get done, all the functions that have to get done, are done. It achieves functional closure. Um, by the way, we have to define function. The word function, I don't have time to do it. The word function is used in biology like the function of your heart's to pump blood. doesn't exist in physics. And it's a 10-minute argument to say why it's okay to say that in biology. Physics can't make a distinction because the function of your heart's to pump blood not to make heart sounds. And physics can't make a distinction between causal consequences. Anyway, so a collective autocratic said, by the way, this proves that you can get molecular reproduction without DNA or RNA, which is kind of a big point for those of us who care. But I want to get across this idea of functional closure. But meanwhile, it's sitting in Gonan's Petri plate. So it's really achieving, quotes, functional closure, but in its world. So now let's just step to a bacteria. Uh, like E. coli, that's sitting in your gut right now. Um, it achieves functional closure, but it's more complex than closure. In myriad things that are going on, it's making DNA and RNA and chemosmotic pumps and membranes and dividing its DNA and, and making proteins and RNA and all kinds of cool stuff and membranes and so on. All of which has to get done for the E. coli to divide. We can't even say what all of the tasks are, okay? But now let's go to the fact that in your, in your intestines, in your, in your guts, you have, and each of us has a slightly different, about 150 bacterial species. And mostly they're not eating one another, mostly they're what are called commensals. Um, namely, they're making a living with one another somehow, and your cells. And most of the cells in your body are bacteria, not you. You'd be dead without these 150. There's 500 species in your mouth. Ask yourself, they're all doing thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of things. What are they doing for one another? None of us knows. It's kind of like an economy, though. Okay? They're interacting with our immune system. They're, they're somehow, yeah, they're connecting with our immune system, all kinds of things. So closure is the wrong word, an ill-defined idea of functional sufficiency. Each one of those critters has a functional sufficiency open to the functional couplings with what else is going on in that ecosystem that keeps you alive. You'd be dead without it. Okay. It varies throughout the day, right? When we yeah, have our lunch or breakfast or we go for a run. All, all of that, and if you take an antibiotics, it changes. So let me talk about a tipping point. Let's go back to Gonan's autocatalytic set. There's nine peptides. If you take one of them out, what happens to it? It stops reproducing, right? It's dead, if you want to call it alive in the first place. It's not merely a bunch of equations of a dynamical system, which a bunch of us have worked on. The thing's got a functional closure, and the tipping point is if you take one of them out, it's dead. It can't do it anymore. It can't achieve functional closure or sufficiency in its world. So the tipping point I want to talk about is that. Now, now, now take the 150 bacterial species in your gut. Um, they're making their way with one another and you. How come? Well, they have a functional sufficiency. What's a tipping point? You take an antibiotic and you kill a bunch of them, okay? And the ecosystem in you changes for a while, and maybe it comes back to the same ecosystem or a neighboring ecosystem. Well, those are tipping points too, and it's due to the functional interactions of those things. It's like an economic web, where you're selling goods and services that are complements and substitutes of one another to keep the economy going. So that's, that's what I mean by a functional closure. Um, and I, I just, you know, in, in terms of medicine, you go from cells to tissues, to organs, to organ systems, to you. It's this hierarchical set of things doing God knows what kinds of functional things with one another. It's not just biochemical. In your kidney are there are things called the loops of Henle that are anatomically next to one another and they, they pump salt and 
neat ways. It's one of the neat things that you learn in medical school. Here's another functional closure that failed. The Soviet Union, in the lifetime of almost all of us, but it collapsed, right? That's one hell of a tipping point. Apartheid is gone. I mean, I went to Oxford. You used to be able to have a three-hour conversation with your South African friends by just saying apartheid and shutting up. <laughs> now, I want to tell you one other big thing, okay? And it's that the way things happen can't be said ahead of time. It's not chaos in the sense that you kind of know chaos in which you've got a system of billiard balls and you're bouncing around. You know what can happen, but you can't predict over time what will happen because the way they bounce and curl off of one another kind of gets out of control and it's called chaos. I want to talk about something else, and I'm going to do it in the legal realm. The same thing's true in the evolution of the biosphere. So I want to talk about the field that Lee and I are so desperately interested in. Uh, we're interested in P4 medicine. <coughs> Medicine, and we're both trained as docs. Uh, he's probably confident. I'm not. But I was. Um, medicine is linked together with the pharmaceutical and the biotech industry, which is linked together with the health insurance industry, and they're in one another's pockets. Right? We all know it. They're in one another's pockets. The, the docs are trying to do good things. The pharmaceutical companies are trying to do good things. Meanwhile, I just read about companies that have come up to try to bargain with the pharmaceutical companies to get cheap prices, to try to pass on the cheap prices to the health insurance companies. You know what those companies are doing? They're taking most of the savings through themselves. They're disintermediating for their own benefit. We face a power structure. We all know. For Americans, we know what's going on in this country. Why? They too are functional holes that are making a living in their world. They're organizations living their own life, getting to survive. I mean, they're not alive in the sense that we are, but they are ongoing organizations that achieve a functional sufficiency in their world. Now I want to tell you something that will be immediately obvious in this context. They live in a regulatory and legal environment, right? How long does it take a lawyer to find a loophole in a law? You know, 15 minutes and you know, $3,000. So, if you find a loophole in the, a law or a regulation, that's an opportunity that opens a new way to go do something, for example, for the benefit of, of one of these companies. But you couldn't say ahead of time what the loophole would be that was found. The loophole opens what I want to call an unrestatable, adjacent, possible opportunity. <coughs> It's true in the biosphere, too. They're called Darwinian pre-adaptations. And these functional holes evolve into the very adjacent possibilities that they and we together create. For example, in our laws and regulations, that along our other goods and services. Bacteria are doing the same thing. Okay, so, these, are, these are good examples of complex systems. But absolutely, and I'm going to now end with the following. <laughs> we evolve into an unprestatable adjacent possible that we ourselves create, the opportunities that we create that we can't say beforehand, nobody knew we were going to get from the Turing machine to the web and selling things on the web, right? Many of us have lived through it. We're sucked into the very possibilities that we create. We don't know what we're doing. We don't know what we're creating. So there is a kind of open-ended, unrestatable evolution with tipping points all over the place. Hang on in there. Well, I think it's really good because a lot of us are very curious about what are all these actions adding up to? Uh, like, when Glad World the book, I mean, we, these small things added up and puzzle people. And now Dennis, it, it, in climate science, uh, we all know, I mean, uh, humanity, we're pumping a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere every single day, and uh, we want to know, I mean, at what point does this uh, reach the, the point of no return? Can we reverse some of this? Have we crossed that tipping point? I know that you guys look at, at these kind of questions in your own way very, very seriously. So can you tell us a little bit about um, how you think about this concept? Sure. My name is uh, Dennis Hartman, uh, the University of Washington Department of Atmospheric Sciences. And I'm not a biologist. I'm a physical scientist. I was trained in physics, chemistry, and uh, mathematics. And as you probably know, uh, humans are 
consuming fossil fuels and putting lots of different greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, especially CO2, which is coming mostly from uh, fossil fuel burning. We know that the CO2 is coming from fossil fuel burning because of the isotopic evidence. It's not a natural process, it's us. We also know that it's uh, warming, and it's warming in a, a way that nature would not have warmed in the absence of human activities. So we're a set of asserting our control of what we call the carbon cycle by introducing CO2 in the atmosphere. This is uh, warming uh, the climate, and uh, we know that uh, if we continue at the current rates, then we'll do something which has um, not been achieved by nature in, in more than a million years. And we're, so we're marching off into territory that we have not uh, experienced before. So my research has to deal with, uh, if we did something like double the CO2, how much would it warm? And that uh, introduces a lot of complex physical processes. For example, my specialty is cloud feedback. Have you ever ridden in a plane and looked out the window and observed the clouds? Imagine, imagine trying to simulate what those would do in a computer. So there's some uncertainty with regard to uh, cloud feedbacks. That's my research. Um, but we do have a best guess of how much it would uh, warm uh, in the future. And that's what we have to uh, concern ourselves with. So thinking about uh, tip tipping points, before I was uh, working in uh, climate research, I worked on the uh, ozone layer in the stratosphere. Does anyone remember the ozone hole? <laughs> so back in the 70s, uh, some chemists predicted that uh, because of the CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, completely man-made chemicals, we were putting in the atmosphere and they were uh, building up. And the place where they were being removed from the system was in the stratosphere where they were blasted apart by uh, high energy electromagnetic radiation from the sun. And the chemists predicted that, uh, well, we should expect a 10% reduction in ozone over the next 20 or 30 years. That was the forecast. But then in the 1980s, uh, it was observed that in the springtime, the ozone disappeared essentially entirely, but only over the south pole. It was kind of a gentle warning, warning from Mother Nature, a little bit of an early warning sign. And it was pretty quickly worked out that the reason for that, because there was some chemistry that we didn't quite understand in which the power of chlorine to reduce the ozone was proportional to the square of the amount of chlorine in the atmosphere. So we were going steadily along and then suddenly the uh, ozone declined precipitously. And fortunately we were able to regulate the emission of CFCs and in another 60 years or so the stratosphere will be back to normal. So it's a fairly long recovery time. In terms of the climate system, what kind of tipping points might we have observed? The climate models were also predicting a relatively slow decline of the Arctic uh, sea ice. And yet in the uh, middle of the previous decade, around 2007 or so, the Arctic sea ice was declining <clears throat> by much more than had been predicted. We don't still don't understand exactly why that's happening. But there are thresholds that are, that are passed which uh, the linear extrapolations that we typically make are not, uh, don't, are not easily captured. The governments of the world have agreed that uh, two degrees Celsius, let's say four degrees Fahrenheit, of global warming, global warming increase by that amount, is what they call dangerous. And that's sort of a qualitative judgment, there are a lot of things that go into that, but if you talk to a glaciologist, which I'm not, but I've talked to some, they will tell you that if we pass that uh, two degree warming threshold, then it's very likely that Greenland will melt uh, irreversibly. It might take hundreds of years, but it's going to go away 
uh, eventually. And the CO2 that we put in the atmosphere is going to stay there for a very long time. So we're entering an era when we might expect fairly uh, dramatic changes in particularly the polar regions. Recently there was a paper published by some scientists at the University of Washington saying that the, um, some of the ice sheets that end up in the water in Antarctica are also likely to be disappearing uh, irreversibly by sliding in the ocean. Again, it may take hundreds of years, but we're not quite sure what the time scale is. So we're entering into a period where we're making changes in the system that haven't been observed before. We don't really know how uh, things will evolve. We do know that the climate system is extremely complex. The ocean interacts with the atmosphere, interacts with the ice, and a particularly unpredictable part of it is probably human society and what it chooses to do about uh, human-induced uh, climate change. At the present time, we're, what, when some of the early projections were made in the 1990s, the first meetings of the IPCC, the scientists sort of assumed that humanity would do something about the greenhouse gases and they would taper off. And there was a, a kind of a normal scenario and then what they thought was a very aggressive scenario where nothing was done. And we actually, over that period since 1990, we've, we've bettered the uh, business as usual scenario, mostly become a, because of a very rapid development um, in the developing world, economic development. When you say better, do you mean exceeded? I mean, we're putting out more <coughs> greenhouse gases, especially CO2, than we imagined that we would be doing. And it's a, it's a human problem, an economic development problem, and a choice to use uh, fossil fuels as opposed to any of the other alternatives we might have available. So this is some sort of ideas of uh, tipping points that we have seen in the uh, physical climate system of Earth and some things <coughs> we might have to look forward to uh, in the future. Great. Now, uh, last but not least, Lauren uh, is a biologist at UW, but she wants to do <coughs> climate science, she tells me. So uh, how do you... <laughs> How do these two disciplines work together? Do you, do you borrow any ideas from one and apply them to the other? Well, so I guess what I do is uh, I'm going to be an ecological forecaster. So despite all these challenges that we talked about in predicting how plants and animals are going to respond to climate change, I give it a try, which might be a bit foolish, but we really need to understand how these systems are going to be responding to the types of changes that Dennis was just talking about. And we all often rely on weather. Today it was a beautiful day, and unlike most days in Seattle, looking at the weather would tell you it would be a good idea to bring a sun hat or sunglasses. So we try to do similar things for ecosystems. We can all think about how we rely on ecosystems for things like food, clean water, around here, great recreation opportunities, our health. And so we're trying to make forecasts of how plants and animals are likely to respond to climate change so we can anticipate the future changes. And it is a challenge. Biology, as um, Stu was talking about, is largely a function of thresholds. So even though we have the climate changing in a gradual manner, at some point organisms are going to be pushed at their limit and they're going to have a more pronounced response. So that leads to quite a few surprises when we're thinking about plants and animals responding to climate change. Um, it makes my job pretty fun. So in particular, I focused on trying to understand how Mostly animals are shifting through the season and shifting through space in response to climate change. And I shouldn't say it's all surprises. We do have a pretty good consistent sense of the sort of broad brush responses of organisms. So about 75% of plants and animals are responding like we would expect them to respond if they're following their preferred environmental conditions. So they're moving up mountains. You can see that around the Pacific Northwest here. They're also moving towards the poles. But when we look at the details, our predictions really start to fall apart. So for instance, I did a recent study where we were trying to see how much of the magnitude of these responses we could account for. And we could only account for about 40% of how far species shifted their seasonal timings in response to climate change. 
wasn't great, but we could only account for about 15% of how far species moved in response to climate change over recent decades. So we have a long way to go in terms of understanding these thresholds and tipping points and systems. And the approach I take, um, Stu did a great job of introducing, is we look at the function of organisms, we look at their role in the ecosystem, and we try to understand how they're interacting with the environment, what that means for how they're likely to respond to climate change. And one of the big challenges in making those predictions is that places on Earth are going to be having new combinations of environments. By 2100, predictions are that about 40% of the Earth will have new combinations of conditions like temperature and precipitation. So we're trying to predict how organisms will respond to conditions they've never seen before. And that poses a real challenge. And one of the threshold responses that a lot of biologists are looking for is the potential that we might be entering a sixth mass mass extinction. If we look at recent rates of species extinction over recent decades, we see that the rates are about 10 times the previous baseline. So this is quite concerning for us as biologists, and there's suggestions that if these <coughs> rates continue, and climate change is a major driver of recent extinction rates, if these rates con continue, we might be entering another mass extinction event within centuries. So I just wanted to briefly give some examples of the kind of approaches we take to try to predict responses to climate change. I spent a lot of time up hiking on mountains trying to look at how high alpine insects, particularly butterflies and grasshoppers, respond to environmental change. And again, we see they are largely shifting earlier in the season as it warms up. They are largely moving up the mountains, but we're also running into a lot of surprises. And one of sort of the heartening surprises that my research group looks at is whether species are evolving to adapt to these new environments. And so we sort of uh, treat it as a little bit of a mystery story. We dig up old data from museums, from old journals, and we try to repeat those old studies and see whether things have changed. So for instance, one thing we recently found was that larval butterflies, so caterpillars, can now feed at temperatures that are much warmer than they could 40 years ago. So if we bring them in the lab in controlled environments, we're able to get pretty conclusive evidence that they can now function in much warmer temperatures than they could in the past. And that's due to gradual genetic evolution over about 40 generations, so about 40 years of evolution in response to recent climate change. And so that's a little flavor of the kind of approaches we take. I wanted to also just mention a little more broadly about some of the tipping points that we might see in these biological systems in response to environmental change. And let's think about some changes we're seeing now in the Pacific Northwest and Western North America more broadly. And one of them is that we're seeing much bigger infestations of bark beetles that are causing mass mortality events in forests. And so over the past several decades, the rates have been about two times higher than we have seen in recorded history. And we can use biology to understand why this is. These bark beetles grow faster in warmer temperatures, so they're able to go from birth to reproduction much faster. They can squeeze in more generations through time. And in addition, we used to have much higher rates of overwintering mortality, so it's much easier to survive these more mild winters now than it was a few years ago. Combined with this effect of increased pests, increased disease, with more forest dying, we also have much higher rates of wildfires, the data is suggesting, than we've been in the past. Over the last several decades, rates of wildfires have been about four times higher than they have been in the past. And this is, again, due to forest dieback, as well as some of the drought conditions that we've been seeing. Another example of interest to us here in the Pacific Northwest, where fisheries is a major resource, <coughs> is that we are starting to see evidence of ocean acidification. And so this process of carbon dioxide entering the ocean and having more acidic conditions is largely a fairly gradual process. But the evidence is increasingly coming in that organisms do have a threshold in which the acidification becomes stressful and we're likely to potentially reach a tipping point for quite a few organisms there. Um, and a final example of tipping points that we think a lot about in ecological systems is the potential for changes in ecosystems. So for instance, some of our tropical forests that are storing a lot of carbon may face increased desertification in the future. Up at these latitudes where we are here, we are starting to see shifts in terms of the tree line moving upward and northward, um, but ultimately we may also have some areas like boreal forests that are no longer 
as they are today in the not too distant future. Boy, you are keeping busy. <laughs> That's a diversified uh, set of experiments that you talk about. Uh, very interesting. Well, um, I want to talk a little bit about I, I, a question I think must be on all three of your minds, and that is how you uh, take an observable phenomenon, which is where a lot of science starts. You, you observe something out in the environment or in the body, and, and then turn that into uh, established fact that, that something is, A is causing B. <laughs> you know, the, how do you establish causation? Um, this is really, this is really important, and uh, I don't think people really understand how that works. And I know this is technical, so let's try to keep this on as high level as we can, but Dennis, you're kind of like, do you want to take this one? Well, in our field, we have models. So in my recent experience, let's talk about the last couple of winters, which have been kind of anomalous in the sense that we've had drought in the West, particularly California, and we have had relatively cold winters in the East, despite the global warming, and people have called the polar vortex and that sort of thing. We have observations and we have models. So um, in my own research, I related these um, changes in the weather seasonally averaged over North America to variations in the sea surface temperature, particularly in the tropical Pacific. Not El Nino necessarily, but something a little bit different. So we can establish a relationship using the data between the two. And then we have models that actually simulate the atmosphere, climate models and weather models. You might not have noticed that weather predictions have gotten pretty good, about to three days or so, much better than they were uh, 30 years ago. So then we have a hypothesis that the sea surface temperatures are, cheap, or are causing these two successive anomalous winters in North America. We apply the sea surface temperatures underneath the atmospheric model, which we have a lot of faith in because we use it for weather prediction. And lo and behold, it produces the uh, weather pattern that the observations show throughout in the West and uh, cold and snowy in Boston and Chicago. So we close the loop between the observations, a hypothesis, and then we can test the hypothesis with the model. But there are a lot of variables that go into the model, right? Indeed. And how do you, uh, over time, do you just constantly tweak the model when you say, you know, this, these variables don't appear to be as important as maybe we thought, or we de-weight them, or, or do we find new variables and incorporate them? How does the model get better? Uh, in the sense of uh, uh, weather prediction, for example, it's more and better observations, more powerful computers, uh, better mathematics for uh, taking the observations and using them to uh, initialize a model. In the area that I work in, in clouds, in the early 2000s, we launched a bunch of satellites that uh, took much more detailed, precise, calibrated observations of uh, clouds and everything else. We're gradually working uh, what those observations are telling us into the physics that we use in the models to predict uh, climate. It's a slow, difficult process, and I have to say that the weather is chaotic, so we don't actually um, get exactly the observations, but we predict the statistics of the observations. Uh -huh. Huh? And in biology, uh, we're getting more data too, but it's hard to measure a lot of phenomena in, in biology. Uh, how do you go about this, Lauren? Yeah, so we largely have the same approach for some of these more complex issues where we're building models and we can test it against observed data. And in biology, we can often have the null model that we can compare our observations to. So we can say these are expectations if there's just random fluctuations in these biological communities through time. We can add climate change, in my case, into the model and say this is what we'd expect under climate change and the large majority of evidence is showing that our recent observations are only consistent with our models that have this climate change forcing in them. 
We do other things, like we, I did talk a lot about surprises, but I did say when we take a broader look, the data is really quite consistent with what we expect. So we can do vote counting type methods where we count the number of organisms that are, that are responding as we would expect in response to climate change. And as I was mentioning, we see about three quarters or upward of species, despite all the individual differences between species, about three quarters of species are responding like we would expect in response to climate change. And ultimately, and increasingly in biology, we're gaining new technological tools where we can better control our expectations. So in my case, where we're trying to repeat historical experiments, we do that in controlled environmental chambers and rooms where we can try to isolate all the other factors except for what we care about, which is often the increase in temperature. When we can take more experimental approaches, it really can increase our confidence in causation. Mm -hmm. Now in human biology, this is much more difficult uh, because we're not lab rats or caterpillars. Uh, there are a lot of a lot of things going on, a lot of stimuli that we come into contact with. Uh, but things that we're getting more, and maybe this is something for Stu, we're getting much better capability to measure lots of things with the genome and, and all kinds of uh, biomarkers. I'm thinking of the study that I'm sure you know about Mike uh, Snyder over at Stanford. They sequenced, mm -hmm. sequenced his genome and they took all kinds of measurements. Um, and he um, uh, had a habit of eating a little bit of ice cream every night before bed. Uh, but he was a, a normal sized guy, 5'10", 160 pounds, something or other, and his normal uh, blood glucose measurements and everything else when you go to the doctor, they look basically fine, no family history of diabetes or anything. But the system uh, was suggesting that he was beginning to tip into a pre-diabetic state. He told the doctor about this, the doctor said it's nonsense, like I, I look at my traditional measurements, the things I just mentioned. Um, but sure enough, within about six months, he started tipping into that uh, a more me classically medically defined diabetic or pre-diabetic state. And then sure enough, he quit eating the ice cream before bed and you know, started bicycling a little more around Stanford campus. And all those blood measurements started coming back into more of a what we define as normal state, no more risk of diabetes. Uh, I wonder, do you, is this, and, and this, we file this under the head of personalized medicine, and you know, everybody's going to have wearable devices to track our blood glucose and things like this. Where do you see this, uh, this are we going to be able to do more things like this uh, in the future on a broader scale uh, as we, we embark on this systems biology uh, approach to medicine? So, so thanks for asking me. You're writing a book about my old friend Lee Hood. Um, who's helping to lead uh, a revolution in how we think of it. Lee, I hope I don't get what I'm going to say. You say wrong when you're incorrect and you're summarizing. Suppose that the idea is this, roughly it's the following. Um, uh, so maybe you have 30,000 to 100,000 genes. Right? There's a debate, let's call it. It used to be 20,000, but now RNA looks like it's playing a functional role. So sequence the genome, okay? Um, look for mutations and all that kind of stuff. Meanwhile, there's epigenetic alterations to the DNA uh, with methylation patterns. Meanwhile, geneticists have known for years if you change the environment, you can induce developmental anomalies. Um, the methylation is an environmental response to things like eating a bunch of ice cream before bed. Yeah, but I just want to know about the environment, okay? So it's been known for years that if you take a developing fruit fly, and expose it uh, during its development, of course, to borate salts. I mean, who thought borate salts? Its antenna turn into legs. So you get a fly with some legs growing out of its head. Um, they're called homeotic mutants, and this is called a phenocopy of a homeotic mutant. Well, how many environmental variables do you think we should think about? Borate salts and aspirin and bubble gum, yeah, right? So now imagine, as Many variables as we can think of, physiological, genetic, environmental, behavioral, uh, exercise, all that stuff. And mathematicians will say, create a really high dimensional space. Every one of these things is an axis. So this is sort of, uh, this is kind of Lee's point. Each of us is a point in that space. Now imagine that this space has regions in it that are gray, that are sick, and pink that are good, okay? Well, one thing to just know is where are the pink regions and the gray regions? Well, we 
sort of know a little bit, but not an awful lot. Will we know an awful lot more about it in the coming decades? Yeah, we really will. And there are then two broad approaches, and I'll say it quickly. One is empirical. Just find out what's happening and fiddle around with things and find out what moves a patient or a little cluster of patients in this space from a trajectory, trajectory going into one of these gray, sick areas, okay, like adult onset diabetes, can move them into an area that's pink. And you can do that without knowing what the mechanisms are at all. I mean, we've been using aspirin since people took willow bark and they found out that, that was neat. So, medicine is in part an empirical science. Also, as we develop causal models, we can hope to do a better job at what Lee Wright calls, you know, N of 1, P4 medicine. He's right. Um, the problem is, is the data is never sufficient to pin down a specific model. But you might get a family of several thousand models that make similar predictions, and then you can try to pick them because they make four or five different predictions. And a final thing is, we're still married to Pasteur's image of the germ theory of disease. So kill the bad germ and you fix the disease. That became in pharmacology the idea, make a drug that hits a single target in the cell. That's the pharmaceutical industry for the past 70 years. Well, if you have thousands of variables doing things to one another, like the weather, or like in you. If you had a bed spring that's wiggling all over the place, would you try to control its wiggling by trying to control one spring? Well, no. You try to control a whole bunch of them to try to get it to wiggle the way you want. So one of the things I think we're going to move for in personalized systems medicine is being able to control tens or hundreds of variables uh, in uh, a patient and know which patient populations in different areas of this space behave more. So I think 50 years from now, medicine is going to be very different. Fascinating. Uh, questions from the audience? I know we've got some microphones here in the front and on the side. Yeah, we've got somebody on the side. We'll cover it up here. Hi. My name is Bruce Mitchell. I'm with a uh, foundation called the Innovative Learning Foundation here in Seattle. I'd like to ask a question to Dr. Kaufman and then see how atmospheric science and biology might respond. When you talk about functional closed systems, uh, it suggests some kind of synergetic direction that these individual processes are attracted to. Yeah. And uh, that's kind of the opposite of a bad tipping point where chaos and entropy set in and things fall apart. Uh, it sounds like your work is, is leading toward trying to understand the kind of synergy that produces bacteria to human beings, of meaning to consciousness to intellect kind of stuff, or the origins of life that you're talking about. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about how you see synergy in the systems you're looking at? And then maybe is there a way to think about, instead of engineering the atmosphere by throwing some chemical up to reflect the sunlight, or we don't know the downstream effects at all, is there a way to think about the biological and atmospheric systems that would work in a synergetic way? Gosh, um, huge question. So, little pieces of it are the following. Just think about the economy for a moment. Um, economists talk about goods and services as complements and substitutes. So, a screw and a screwdriver are complements, and a screw and a nailer are substitutes. Well, the economy is full of interwoven webs of complements and substitutes, right? <laughs> substitutes are competing with one another. Complements can form the analog of autocatalytic holes, okay, you know, a set of complementary things that essentially create market niches and opportunities for the goods that are produced. That's happening all over the place. But it's this rich mixture of functionally, this is functional right now, but it doesn't have to be, positive feedback loops and negative feedback loops that create, it's incredibly complicated. And uh, you mentioned consciousness and other things that, that are, you know, these amazing topics that I think about, but I'm not going to try to talk about tonight. Um, so, so I think that I think the thing to hold in mind, and actually this is something for Lauren to talk about, the biosphere has evolved for 3.7 billion years. It's still going. 
99% of all species, or 97%, have croaked, have gone extinct. Yet the average diversity of the biosphere has increased over the past six, six, six or seven hundred million years. The average diversity. There's still extinction events like we may be causing now. <coughs> I'd like to see us think about an analysis of, roughly speaking, helpful cycles and competitive cycles function in all kinds of ways. The biosphere is telling us what has happened what has worked. And Lauren, you can probably speak to that better than I. But, but there's a lot of information out there. Yeah, maybe I will um, chime in that that is certainly an approach that people are thinking about even in applied sense in terms of how critters are responding to environmental change. And some of it is sort of thought of as you know, preserving the arena. We have had organisms thriving on this earth for a long time, evolving in response to long-term changes. Of course, the changes that they're facing now might be much more rapid, but if we provide the locations, the resources, the intact type ecosystems that they need to be able to dynamically respond, then that might be a more successful future than if we do try to more micromanage their responses to change. Great, another question? Well, I'll say is that I, I believe in Calvin for you. Um, well, I'd like to ask you about all the catalytic. This question's really for Des. Uh, <clears throat> there are several kinds of tipping points that we normally think in terms of. There's the pulling the trigger on the gun, got to pull it just hard enough, and it goes bang uncontrollably. There are other kinds that are like pushing a baby carriage up to the top of the hill and going over the crest. And all of a sudden, you have to hold it back to keep it from going downhill. I mean, there are things you can do about it. that. Uh, but when the questions are asked in terms of climate, uh, we have a problem because the the models that we use uh, in a physical system will be working models that are almost like the real thing, but we've left out some. It's sort of like having a model train doesn't all the complexity of the railroad switching area, but some of them. But that's what model making in physics, physical sciences is largely about. You don't include more complexity than you need to, to, to see what that part of it does. Your skeleton models of the climate, for example, and they'll show you all sorts of things like Coriolis forces and so on that you expect to fall out of the system. But they're Leave out things that are in the nature of things we don't understand very well. We don't understand our climate change very well. So it's left out of all the working models. And the reason I, I, I guess I'm concerned about this in the public sphere is that the public thinks that the climate models are sort of like a weather prediction. And we have systematically left out all of the overall stuff that we know happens in nature. We know all sorts of things happen very quickly in climate, just from the uh, high square records. But the public doesn't realize that while we're practicing good science by following you know, a good strategy for uh, building up to the complexity using skeleton models, uh, we're, we're not communicating effectively to the public well, I think that we're point. only showing you slow stuff. This is a good point. There are models and there are models. There's a model for, say, uh, designing an airplane on a CAD, you know, a software program on a computer that will predict whether a plane with this amount of weight and structure will fly. We, we know that based on laws of physics and everything else. And then there's models for, like, uh, mice uh, with cancer drugs, and they're not very predictive at all. Uh, or, you know, we certainly can't model a whole human being on a computer and see how a drug will respond and whether it will cure cancer. Much more complex system. So, th this goes to this question of how much confidence should we have in uh, the, the kinds of models that are put forth. Well, I think where uh, Bill was going was that the scientific process with regard to climate is a little bit conservative. We don't really want to predict that the ice is going to slide into the ocean. It's a really hard thing to do. So we do the sort of simple 
linear extrapolations that tell us if you put a certain amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, it's going to warm up. But that's not going to be a good science. But the problem is, is what we're reporting on public is something else, or it needs to be something else, and not just, well, this is the part that we can give a good prediction on because it's gradually cumulative and we just add them up. We, we, we fail to get across to them that there are things in the system that we can't yet model, but we know which happened in record. And we're not conveying to the public the fact that very nasty things can happen in very short times and have happened in the past. Yes, but then if you do that, you get a little bit outside of what's certain right. scientifically, and you get accused of being a sky is falling, and so you lose a little bit of your credibility if you emphasize too much the terrible things that could possibly happen, so we don't do that. But if you start a pool of to see the fire, but report your smoke instead. Yeah. I was intrigued by the first questioner's uh, comment about nonlinear reactions and turning points, tipping points. In the climate problem, the human economic and social value systems are sort of deeply involved in that. There are options for a future <coughs> in which we have all the energy we want and we're not putting a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere, but we're not taking that path. And someday I think there, I'm optimistic that there's going to be a kind of psychological economic turning point where we say, hey, let's go that way, let's use solar. That is an interesting turning point question, which I know nothing about. Well, and it's to point out hard like Sometimes they just be turned over. Yeah. <laughs> because the society does change its mind, well, it's impossible to tell what we do so. That's right. That's a very unpredictable system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yeah, here on the side. Hi. Um, in systems biology, I'm just curious, how much of a role does, um, particularly in like, looking at the human body, uh, how much of a role does psycholo psychological and cultural factors get involved, or even in like climate modeling, like you just mentioned, how much are we looking at the psychological implications of everything and how that would actually have an interaction in, in real life? Who's the question to the panel as a whole? To the panel, I think. Probably mostly towards you, because you were Working in systems biology? <laughs> um, emotional components and psychological components are just an enormous part. I mean, look at what Dennis was just saying that we all know, right, about our economy, our power structures, our choices of energy sources. It could be carbon neutral or we could be using solar energy if we cared enough. Um, the, the people who are doing the good works of mopping the floor and people who are doing the good works of being uh, um, uh, you know, the head coach of the Yankees are getting enormous emotional rewards for doing what they're doing, but so are the presidents of the big banks that are selling short themselves and selling long to their customers, you know what that phrase means, right? And, and for those people, they feel they're doing their job well and right, and they're proud of themselves, even though everybody is getting, and I won't use the word, but you know what I would say. <laughs> so, so what's going on is, um, and my, my wife Kate in the audience has written a wonderful paper on this on, on the emotional system, with four negative emotions and one positive emotion, fundamental, and then complex things like admiration, and hate, greed, and so on, coming on later. It's the main source, I'm putting her, of our valuations. We can debate what's moral and what's not, but surely without emotion we wouldn't have, we wouldn't be valuing anything. Well, that's the so, stock market, right? Yeah. So it's, it's driving an enormous amount. And the only, I mean, there's social psychology, but, but do we really understand, and politics understands this pretty well, for better or worse. So it's huge. 
part of the interdisciplinary field of the systems biology? Is that actually applied in the lab? <laughs> uh, the short answer is, and you can speak to this too, and as can Kate, it, it needs to be. I mean, you know, an awful lot of people have mental illnesses. A lot of people have all kinds of things um, that, that, that alter their physical health, that alter... It's going to be part of N1 medicine. It's going to be psychological traits, behavioral traits, exercising, eating the ice cream, all that stuff. And we only understand little bits of it. One other sort of word to all of us is, if, if you're looking at anything that's going on, and it's got lots of interacting causal processes, okay? Like tens or twenties or something like that. We don't know how to, we don't know how to analyze it, and the reason we don't <coughs> is, if it's one variable that's going up and down, we all know how to do it. Everybody knows a Gaussian distribution, a normal distribution, right? So you all know you can see if the mean is shifted, right? In, in, a, in a, a control population and a, an experimental population, so it's just a t-test. If you have 40 variables that are interacting, and you want to try to see the effect of one of them, you don't have any notion ahead of time what it ought to be, so you don't know how to test for what the effect is. So we don't know how to analyze systems where there's high multi multiple causality, unless we have chemistry data, so we do the reactions, which you can say, yeah, this thing really is, it really does go as square as the concentration of, of, uh, of chlorine. Oh, well, Laura, you can't do that for an ecosystem. At least I don't think you can, right? It's, it's a really good question. And I would just say as one quick follow-up to that, which is, you know, when you look at, say, climate model status, I mean, it, it would be sort of like trying to factor in the probability of a massive public fear event over, say, half of Greenland falling into the ocean. Like if half of Greenland fell into the ocean and then the public said, oh my God, what have we done? We must change our ways and stop using fossil fuel today. You know? What's the probability of something like that happening? Hopefully, <laughs> and that really is zero. Yeah, because that would be a supremely disastrous uh, event. But psych psycholo psychology does uh, enter into everything we do. I just reviewed a book that was written by a colleague of mine who's a climate scientist and also got a degree in Jungian psychology and is a Buddhist. And he put all these things together into a book because as he would go out and talk to people, about climate change, their expressions would change, they would withdraw, they'd get kind of sad, or they would get angry because they want to kill the messenger because it's bad news and they don't, don't like it. Right? So there's a huge psychological factors, and even in the way scientists approach things, because we're all human beings, we're pre-wired to fix it. What's that book Putting the heart into the world, it's not published yet, but Prince about, I was going to say, to think about other critters, you know, we do see that their behavior, even their fear, is really influencing some of these responses to change. Okay, we have time for just one more. I think you just started down where I was wanting to ask you. Uh, Lauren uh, mentioned that in some of your research that you've been only able to account for, uh, say, like 15% of a change in the system as related to climate change. I wanted to suggest that maybe you could talk to this that perhaps that 15% is what is forced by climate change. But in fact, all living things tend to be extremely opportunistic. And might it not be that a large portion of the remainder is related to climate change because it is presenting new opportunities, which those biological systems are now taking advantage of. Yeah, that certainly could be the case in terms of new opportunities. Um, I guess I'm not very confident because of these tipping points that we've done a good job for accounting all of to all of the climate forcing per se. Um, organisms all have quite different, say, thresholds in terms of when they're facing thermal stress. And right now we don't know how to describe those <coughs> tipping points well enough to be confident that we've already accounted for a large amount of the climate forcing. So yes, yeah, certainly there's a lot of other factors, but we also have a long way to go to really understand the details by which organisms are responding to those climate changes. All right, well, uh, I think we're out of time. Everybody, can you please give our panel a round of applause? I'd like to introduce, uh, for some closing remarks, uh, Lee Hood, the president of the ISP. <laughs> well, 
I'm here to remind you that on April 6th and 7th, we're going to have a symposium at ISV on tipping points in medicine and ecology. And I'd urge uh, all who are interested in extending this discussion to come and, and listen. And I'll give you two tidbits about the health side of things. So clearly, tipping points are about changes in state, uh, from one state to a second state, and about the question of, can we detect very early on those changes so we could prevent uh, the changes if the change, for example, is from wellness uh, to disease. So with regard to an earlier question of how are we ever going to quantify, and it wasn't quite put this way, but can we quantify the psychological? I think we'll be able to do it. For example, one study we've done recently is to investigate um, 40 soldiers from Afghanistan that came back normal and 40 that came back with extreme forms of post-traumatic stress disorder. And what we were able to find is a blood panel at very high sensitivity and specificity that distinguish those two features. Now, a big part of what PTSD is all about is stress, and quite clearly, you're beginning to make the blood a window that can view not only the physiologic changes, but the psychological changes as well. And a second set of experiments that uh, ISB started in March of last year was to take a hundred individuals and to create a virtual cloud of billions of data points of many, many different types of data for each. And to create that cloud anew every three months so we could see how the dynamics of the individuals were changing. And we saw four really interesting tipping points in that population. We saw some people go from a state of wellness to increased wellness. And we saw some do the inverse, start well and decline in wellness. But most striking, we saw people that started well, transitions to disease, and those that did exactly the inverse. And of course, what is exciting about this is we now have the data to begin quantifying these tipping points and to, for example, at the very earliest stages of disease, come to understand the fundamental mechanisms that are beginning to initiate the tipping point so that we can reverse those tipping points early and bring people back into uh, a wellness uh, trajectory. So these are examples of the kinds of topics that will come. Uh, the, fast, the discussion has been absolutely fascinating, and I'm sure it will be extended to many other areas at this symposium. So uh, thank you very much all for coming, and we wish you uh, the very best. And the speakers will be around to talk to people who are interested uh, after we close, and we're closed right now. Thank you. <laughs>